This is the Sony A7CR. It's what happens when you take an A6700, rip out the internals, and stuff an A7R5 inside. And the result is simply amazing. So this is the Sony A7CR, which is what happens when you take the compact A6700, rip everything out, and then somehow stuff an A7R5 inside. And in theory, that should be amazing. The A7R5, after all, it's just it's one of my favorite cameras. And as a result, the A7CR is so good in so many ways. And yet, you probably shouldn't buy it. And it feels like I shouldn't be saying that because you have this stunning 61 megapixel sensor, you have state-of-the-art autofocus, 4K video up to 60 frames per second in a camera body that's 53% less volume than the a7R5. And yet somehow this combination hasn't made me stock up on ramen in anticipation of having $3,000 less in my bank account, especially because as of today, Sony announced the less expensive a7C2, with the only difference being this actual sensor. So is it worth spending $800 more to buy this one instead? Sony seems to think so, but let's find out. Now what's interesting about the A7CR is it's a brand new camera, and yet there isn't anything on this camera that really feels new and that I haven't used on some other Sony camera. In fact, the, the most new part of this camera to me is actually this grip extension. And I feel like this grip extension was created just to shut me up because I have definitely criticized Sony's more compact cameras for being a bit too small. Sony, you have officially shut me up with this. Uh, you can install this in seconds. It's going to still be really easy to get to the battery. And I feel like it definitely improved ergonomics, especially with some of the larger lenses. And the best part is if you need to take this off and go compact, or when shooting on the gimbal, I found this helpful. You can, it literally takes a few seconds to get this thing. So the only thing I wish, I'm kidding, it's absolutely fine. It's actually included with the A7CR. So thank you, Sony, for listening to me on this one. Now the rest of the hardware, it feels both perfect and yet a little underwhelming at times. And this should make, this should make sense because this is around $800 cheaper than the a7R5 without sacrificing much of anything on the internals. So where is that savings gonna come from? It's gonna come from the hardware itself. And so what you're gonna notice about this camera is just missing a few things that we had on that camera. So on the plus side, it's a super compact camera and where you notice it the most is gonna be this height, especially with this grip off. And what's interesting is that the a7R5, it was already smaller than the competition. It's vastly smaller than the Canon R5. It's vastly smaller than the Nikon Z8. And so this just takes it to the next level when it comes to compactness. And where you notice it as well is the weight. And the weight savings matter, especially because Sony has a ton of absolutely stunning compact lenses that are small, they're lightweight. So the new 50 millimeter F1.4, the 35 millimeter 1.4, those G Master lenses are great. But even this 24 to 70 F2.8 is also very small, works perfectly with this. And this is the new 16 to 35 F2.8 announced today. So if you haven't subscribed, now might be the time to do it because there's tons of stuff on the way, including that. Uh, I also have a list of all my recommended gear for this camera and the a7C2 lenses, SD cards, gimbals, all kinds of stuff for that. And I do have a video on the a7C2 on the way, so stay tuned. Now the underwhelming part of this hardware, it's, it's exactly the same as the a7C2. That's not technically a bad thing. I like the hardware of the a7C2, but in this case, this camera is almost $3,000 and it doesn't quite feel worthy of that. So 
Companies like Apple, they have a Pro-N phone or Pro-N watch that uses titanium or have a better display. There's none of that going on here. So Sony also didn't pull like a Leica. This doesn't a special edition body. It does include the grip, but that's about it. There's no custom straps or anything like that. So for a camera this expensive, it sometimes feels mediocre. So the viewfinder, it's 2.3 million dots. It's okay, it's small. The screen, it's also about 1 million dots, which is pretty average for a flip screen. It's a flip screen, which I do like, but it doesn't have that like dual tilt action of the a7R5 either. You have a single card slot, which I absolutely expected. However, there's no CF Express dual option like you would get on the a7R5 or pretty much all of the bigger cameras. The good news is if you need better hardware, you can just buy an a7R5, but it does feel like even for a pretty compact camera at this price, it should have maybe had a little bit more going for it. Now that's not to sound negative because where it counts the most, Sony did get it right. And the first thing is going to be image quality. So this is a 61 megapixel backside illuminated sensor that's basically one of the highest quality sensors in any full frame camera as of today. And it's doing that at a higher resolution than most cameras on the market, which is even more impressive. You get insane dynamic range, insane detail, and even the low light on this camera is actually still pretty good. Now for all of you camera nerds out there, so yes, this is the exact same sensor that's in the A7R5. And honestly, Sony sensors really haven't improved since the A7R3, which was like six years ago, which is crazy. But get over it because this is still the best quality image sensor in pretty much every high resolution camera. And where you're gonna notice it the most is gonna be that dynamic range and enough detail to just make you zoom into every image just for fun. Hey guys, I'm Sally, better known as the wife to Dan Watson. I'm a portrait and wedding photographer, and I had to pop on here to say how impressed I am by this camera. Now, given we have the same sensor in here as the a7R5, I am still blown away by the image quality, the dynamic range that Sony always produces. I've been shooting with other cameras lately and I just came back to this and I have been so, so blown away. I had the opportunity to take a model out and honestly, every single image coming out of this camera, I kept telling Dan to come to my computer because I was so blown away by the image quality, the dynamic range that this camera was able to produce. Now, everybody asks me as well, Sally, what can I purchase that small and that has great image quality. This, this is your new best friend. Here is my new answer. I am so blown away by this camera. Great job, Sony. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Now, the other thing is Sony really gets right is gonna be autofocus. And again, like if you've used the Sony a7R5, this isn't gonna be any better than that, but it's not an issue because it's still basically the best autofocus that you can get in any camera, it's insanely fast, especially with Sony's newer lenses. And it does have some tricks from even some pretty recent Sony cameras. So if you haven't watched like my a7R5 review, which you can right up there, the Sony a7CR also has an AI autofocusing unit, AI autofocusing processing unit. And what that means is that you can basically tell it what subject you wanna focus on from a pretty long list and the camera will lock on to that subject just so well. It also uses a predictive algorithm. And where I find this works the best is when focusing like on people. So if your subject just turns around, if your subject um, has glasses on and puts those on, if you can't see their eyes, if they blink, if they walk behind a tree, things that will confuse just about every other camera, the A7CR will know where the person should be and can focus on a barely visible subject, which is just absolutely insane. And the camera will actually use this predictive or what Sony calls AI autofocus on quite a few subjects. The only thing that I wish was improved or could be improved is that you still have to tell it what subject you're focusing on. It doesn't just see a human being and switch to human autofocus detection. So if you're moving between a lot of different subjects pretty often, it's just one more thing to remember to do. Even if you have the wrong subject selected, it's still going to focus. It's just not going to have all of this predictive autofocusing detection ability. Now, I really don't see this as being like a video camera, but it's actually better than it should be. And so for a non-video camera, especially a high resolution one, 
because high resolution is just never good for video, it can actually produce a very good video signal. So it can still oversample, which looks absolutely amazing. And what I love about this is just how much control you have over so many things. So even like codecs, you can still shoot your highest end all eye compression, or you can shoot H.264, H.265, up to 10 bit 422. But you can also dial it back if you want to. So if you want to save on card space, you can shoot 420 or even 8-bit, but don't shoot 8-bit. It does have 4K60. It does shoot in a crop in 4K60, but the crop is actually smaller than the A7C2, which is a good thing for this. Now, one thing that's interesting is uh, the A7R5 can shoot in 8K. And despite using the exact same sensor, this camera doesn't. Now, I don't think this needed 8K, but if you're wondering like a possible reason for it, it could be overheating because this camera, just anytime you stuff the same high resolution sensor and crazy processor into a body that's this small without a lot of heat dissipation is going to be very risky. And I did see that overheating warning pop up quite a bit while I was shooting with this camera. Uh, for me, it's this is not like a dedicated video camera, so I don't think it's a massive deal at all. And you also have cameras like the A7R5 or something very video centric like the FX3, which will handle video a whole lot better. But just know like if you're shooting very long format video, especially if you're in the sun or something like that, you might have some issues on this camera. Also because of the high resolution sensor and the kind of the slow speed readouts of the sensor, you will see some rolling shutter if you're not too careful. Again, it's not a camera I would buy for video, but I do think the quality and the video features for this are absolutely amazing. I also don't see this being like a sports and wildlife camera. And in this case, the specs are actually gonna back that up because at 61 megapixels, it's gonna be slow, but it's actually slower than I expected. And the first thing is gonna be the mechanical shutter. So the frame rates are actually limited on this camera to eight frames per second, which on the A7R5, they were 10 frames per second. And on the A7C2, they're also 10 frames per second. Now, I'm pretty sure this is because the shutter mechanism isn't the same as the A7R5 because the shutter speeds, the max shutter speed, tops out at a 4,000th of a second instead of an 8,000th of a second. And that's kind of a bummer for me. Now, switching to electronic shutter, this should be at least a little bit faster or at least the same on a Sony camera, but it's actually slower. It says 7 frames per second in electronic shutter. So I don't know why it kind of seems counterintuitive that the mechanical shutter would be faster but remember, you have an SD card slot and you can't use the faster CF Express cards like the A7R5 and the file sizes for this are just huge. So if you're shooting uncompressed RAW, you don't have a whole lot of frames before it really starts to hit that buffer. And even in compressed or like a lossless compressed, it's still going to be pretty slow for shooting and that buffer gets filled up really quickly. Now the A7CR, it does have one trick that's missing from the a7c2 in case 61 megapixels isn't enough which it absolutely should be you can actually use pixel shift which moves the sensor around using the ibis system and creates multiple frames to create an even higher resolution image but personally i've never looked at a 61 megapixel image and thought man i just wish this was larger and i think having like the 10 frames per second shooting rate of the a7c2 is a little bit more tempting than having 100, 200 megapixel images. Now on one hand, this doesn't have a lot of competition because Nikon Z8, it's just a tank next to this camera. Canon also doesn't make like a high-end compact camera. The Fujifilm does, but it's not full frame. The Leica M series is probably the closest, but it's gonna be like triple the price. On the other hand, the Sony a7C2 and the a7R5 are really enough competition for me to say you probably shouldn't buy this because if you want a high resolution insanely awesome camera get the a7r5 it has a better screen it has the best dual flip and tilt mechanism i've ever used on a camera you have dual cards that can also use the faster cf express cards which is almost a mandatory if you're shooting anything quick higher frame rates you have 8k video on that camera you have a full-size hdmi port you have less overheating issues and it's still massively smaller than all the competition and if you want like a super compact camera just get the sony a7c2 which is it's less expensive it's identical except it has 33 megapixels instead of 61 
And the hardware and features of the a7C2 are just more in line with a camera in that price range. And honestly, 60 megapixels, it's pretty taxing on like your card space, hard drives, and computers. So maybe if you want a travel camera like the a7C2, but you just want the best of the best, uh, when you spec out a MacBook Pro, a thousand dollar upgrade for four terabytes doesn't make you cringe. Maybe then you should buy this camera, but the image quality on this, it's, it's amazing. It's the best you can get for a compact camera. It's really unparalleled. The autofocus is going to be just some of the best on the market. You have amazing video quality, despite this being a high resolution camera. And there just isn't anything else on the market that ticks all of these check marks. Now for me, it's going to be the A7R5 all day long, but let me know which one you guys are the most interested in. And again, I got videos on the 1635 A7C2 on the way, so subscribe. And I'm actually doing some shoots this week with a $2 million Bentley. So lots of BTS and images on IG. And I also have links in the description to all my gear on this and the new A7C2. So hit me up with any questions in the comments again, because for me, the Sony A7CR... It's still going to be the best image quality and the best compact camera you can buy today, even if I wouldn't actually buy it.